uh, Puxatani Phil saw his uh, shadow, so your friends up north got to live with six more weeks of snow. So send them all pictures of you uh, watching TV on the back patio, eating wings, watching the Super Bowl this afternoon. I thought because it's Groundhog's Day, I'd preach last week's sermon, um, but I figured I'd give you a new one. I was born in 1960, so I'm a child of the TV sitcom era. And I grew up uh, watching 30-minute comedic shows uh, like I Love Lucy, my favorite, Hogan's Heroes, uh, The Partridge Family. And one of the residual effects of uh, watching TV comedy shows instead of playing video games is that I can, from memory, sing every theme song from every TV show. Anybody with me? If you're under 30, I know you're lying because you grew up with video games. So here's my favorite. If you know it, sing it along. Have fun. Watch this. Come and listen to my story about a man named Jed. A poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. And then one day he was shooting at some food. And up to the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is, black gold, Texas tea. Well, the first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kinfolks said, Jed, move away from there. Said, California is a place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly Hills, that is, swimming pools, movie stars. The Beverly Hillbilly. Pastor West, that's like a family reunion for you, wasn't it, boy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. You think about old Jed Clampett. You, talk, you think you have a hard life. Jed, Jed, Jed has to raise them three. And, and, and what he didn't know, what, what Jed didn't know, is that just beneath the surface, he was living on top of black gold and Texas tea. He was a billionaire, and he didn't even know it. Seems to me that that would describe a lot of followers of Jesus. Maybe most, sadly. That that many followers of Jesus live their entire lives not knowing that just beneath the surface there are untold riches yet to be released. If if there's a Bible verse that ought to set you back on your heels, it's Romans 8, 11. Look Look with me at it on the screen. It's in your notes. And read it aloud with me. Ready? Go. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to say this, but instead of the word you, I want you to say me. Ready? Go. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in me. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who on that first Easter morning entered the life, the body of Jesus and resurrected him, lives inside of you. Do you believe that that kind of power, that that kind of kingdom impact lives inside of you, and yet so many of us live our lives kind of like Jed back, back on the old farm, just beneath the service, surface, we're billionaires, and we don't even know it. And that's why um, during these days, uh, your pastors have been trying everything they can to convince you That the God of the universe, the God who made everything, and the God who made you has a God-sized mission for you. Let me remind you what we've said from day one, hour one, is that when you discover and deploy this God-sized mission in your life, it will first of all bring God honor, it will secondly bless other people, and thirdly, it'll bring you joy. Now, I want to make a distinction this morning, a difference if you will between what we're going to call the first call for every Christ follower and what for a few minutes this morning we're calling the second calling. Now you remember that last week Pastor Kevin stood right here, shared with you about his confirmation experience and about how he heard the pastors and teachers of his life say that he needed to follow Jesus. That's what we're calling the first call. And every person on this planet is being, is being invited to follow Jesus. Uh, you might not know this, 
But about one-third of the planet has said yes to Jesus. About one-third of the planet has said no to Jesus. And about one-third of the planet says, who's Jesus? They, they, they have no access. Remember around here, we call no access to Jesus means there's no church in their village, no Bible in their language, no Christian in their life. That in spite of all the technology, a full one-third of the planet has no access to Jesus. And that's why, by the way, Grace Church seeks to be a missional church, both locally and internationally, because we want to join Jesus, especially in those places where his name is not known. Now, here's the deal. That one-third of the planet that said yes to Jesus, what they did is they're simply obeying Jesus' call, as Pastor Kevin said, to follow him. That comes out of the Bible. Look with me at John chapter 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, Come, what? Follow me. So when you said yes to Jesus in that first time, you were simply saying, come and follow me. And it doesn't matter, as we've talked about around here, whether that happens at a light switch moment or whether it happens like a dimmer switch. It doesn't matter whether it happens in a moment or over a season. What matters is that you've come to a place in your life where you've said, Jesus, I want to follow you. That's the first call. Now, we have some confusion about this first call, though. Uh, Rick Warren was being interviewed one time, and they said, Rick, what's it like to pastor a high commitment? That was the phrase they used, a high commitment church. And Rick laughed, and he said, high commitment church? He said, well, yeah, I mean, your, your church has such great impact, not just in California, but all over the world. You've written books and videos, and all kind, you, you started Celebrate Recovery. I mean, what high commitment? Rick said, you don't understand we don't ask followers of Jesus at Saddleback to do anything, listen to me, that the Bible doesn't tell ordinary followers of Jesus to do. Do you know what ordinary followers of Jesus do? Do you know what those who've answered the first call of Jesus, come follow me, do? They worship passionately. Um, they, 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 they gather with other believers consistently. They pray fervently. They give generously. They serve consistently. That's ordinary following of Jesus. Let me just say this to you. You don't get a prize for doing that stuff. That's just following along behind Jesus. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, this is what it means. Pastor Arlene, uh, when we were meeting together as a teaching team, she said, your God-sized mission isn't coming to church and worshiping. That's what God expects of every follower of Jesus. That's for the ordinary. That's the first call. This series, Dare to Dream, has been a series designed around the second call. This calling that God has on your life where he says, I have something unique, specific, personalized, individual for every person on this planet. It's where they join me in their God-sized mission. It gives their life meaning and it gives their life purpose. So this morning, we're going to get down to brass tacks, T-A-C-K-S. I thought for years it was tax, T-A-X. I looked it up on Google. Here's what I discovered, and then somebody told me the rest of the story this morning. It had something to do with hardware stores and, uh, and draperies, and here's what I discovered. When they, make, uh, when they make furniture and you turn it over, if it had metal tacks, it would rust away. But if it had brass tacks, oh, that was a good piece of furniture. And so here's the deal. It has to do with the details. So we're going to get down to the details of what it means to not just discover, but to deploy, to live into this unique second calling. Here's the question of the morning. How do I live into my unique, specific, God-sized mission? Now to do this, we're going to look at an Old Testament character from the book of Genesis. We're going to look at this character by the name of Jacob. Now, Jacob was the youngest of twin boys. He was the youngest of twin boys. His older brother was named Esau, which in Hebrew meant red, and his name was Jacob, which in Hebrew meant heel grabber. His brother was called red because he was born with red hairy hair all over his body, 
And Jacob was called heel grabber because when he was born, he was literally born grabbing his brother's heel. The word heel grabber is translated into Hebrew and can mean the word deceiver. So Jacob's name became his character. And they were a Jerry Springer family if there ever was one, all right? Because his father Isaac loved the manly red Esau, and Jacob was a mama's boy loved by his mama, Rebecca. And they put fun in dysfunction, baby. They were dysfunctional as the day is long. And it led to a unique set of circumstances where Jacob, the second born, steals and connives his brother away from his birthright and his family blessing. And when we're going to look at, when we begin our story with Jacob today, he's on the run from his brother who wants to kill him. And what we noticed as we studied Jacob's life this week as a teaching team is that Jacob, like most of the biblical characters, seemed to kind of follow this predictable pattern on how they discovered their unique second calling, this God-sized mission. So let's look at this pattern. Number one, number one, we have to hear it. We have to hear it. Now, Jacob, remember, he's on the run from his brother who wants to kill him for stealing his birthright and his blessing. Don't you love that many of the characters in this book called the Bible are women and men that God taps on the shoulder for a kingdom-sized assignment and they're on the run? Don't you love it that God loves prodigals and runaways? I'm grateful for that. God loves prodigals and runaways, and, and, and Jacob is, is on the run. He's, he's out a few nights, and, and, he, and he goes to bed. And before he goes to bed, he gets a rock, and he sleeps on the rock. The rock becomes his pillow. And in his dream, in this vision that he has from God, he sees a stairway to heaven. And then he woke up, and he wrote this really cool rock ballad song called... <laughs> Okay, he didn't do that. But it would have been way cool if he did. You know, it didn't happen that way. Okay, so he, he has this dream, and in this dream he sees this stairway to heaven, and here's what God says to him in the stairway to heaven. It's in your notes. It's on the screen. Genesis 28, 13 through 15. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, this is what the Lord said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, the God of your father Isaac. Now the ground that you are lying on belongs to you, and I'm giving it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. And what's more, I'm with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. One day, I'll bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised. Now, Jacob, here's this, this God-sized mission that the land that he's sleeping on and his descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. Now, there's a lot of dust in this world, right? Of the dust of the earth. And not only that, God says, no matter where you go, Jacob, I'm going to be with you. Now, that's some promise and some calling from God. And if I'm Jacob, I've got the same excuses that Moses had last week. I'm thinking, God, don't you know who I am? I'm a renegade, I'm a stealer, and I'm a liar. Now let me remind you of this truth. We use this phrase around church a lot, and here it is. You know, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And you see that here in Jacob's story. He, see, he feels disqualified. Jacob, just like Moses, is just another crackpot that God wants to put his glory inside so that God's glory can be revealed through his weakness and through his brokenness. You see, God, listen to me, church, God does not need your strength. He needs your brokenness. And his glory will shine through, and people will be blessed through your weakness when they see his glory shining through it. So he wakes up from the dream, and doesn't he wake up and all of a sudden, Jacob is like Billy Graham and Mother Teresa all wrapped up into one. He's this high, super spiritual person, right? No. No. He has this amazing stairway to heaven dream, and, and he doesn't wake up super spiritual. Here's how you know. 
Read the prayer that Jacob gives back to God. Read what Jacob says to God. Here's how it goes. Let me give you my, just, uh, my, my two cents on this. Jacob says to God, he says, God, uh, let's make a deal. Here's the deal, God. If you'll keep me alive, because my brother's trying to kill me, if you'll take care of me, if you cover my back, if you'll make sure that I've got food to eat and clothing on my back, then God, if you'll do all of those things, then God, guess what? I'll follow you. Now, if I'm God, I'm thinking, I'm going to strike the little brother dead right now, right? But stay with me on this one. Isn't it cool that God sees us for who we can be, not who we are? God takes Jacob, listen to me, Grace Church. This ought to make somebody shout. God takes Jacob where he is, not where he should be. I said somebody should shout for that. Come on. Somebody should say amen. God takes you and me where we are, not where we should be. He's messy, this guy, Jacob. And this God, this God who calls him and says, I'm going to give you property and I'm going to give you a people and I'm going to be with you no matter where you are. At least, here's the deal, here's what Jacob has going for him. He listens to God. God takes him right where he is. He marks the moment. He listens to God. Now, I want to ask you, real simple, are you listening? Or are you doing a spiritual version of this? Na, 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 na. Are you listening to God and his God-sized dream for your life? We see that that was kind of the first part of the journey. But there seems to be this second part that we see in the life of Jacob. He not only hears it, he secondly, he marks it. He marks the moment. And that's what we have to do. We have to, we have to mark the moment. You've heard the, phrasing, the phrase, today is a red letter day. It's marking something as important. Today is both Super Bowl Sunday, today is both Groundhog's Day, and it's also Sunday, the Lord's Day. And uh, we're not going to pray about the Super Bowl and who's going to win, okay? Because Denver's going to win. All right. So, <laughs> but let me just say this. I just don't think God cares. All right. So, so, so Jacob, though, he he. he he gets out his calendar, and he circles this day, and he says, today I'm marking that this, this is a red letter day. And you say, George, how do you know that? Well, look with me at verse uh, 18 and 19. It says, the next morning, Jacob got up very early. This is after the dream. And he took the stone that he had rested his head against, and he set it upright. So he takes his pillow, and he sets it upright as a memorial pillar. And then he poured olive oil all over it, and he named the place Bethel, which means house of God, although it had been previously called Lutz. Now, here's what you need to know. I did not know this until this week. Went to Bible college and seminary. Did not know this. That when he does this, when Jacob does this, you know what he's doing? He's following the rituals of the other pagans in his community. This is what pagans would do. They would take a rock and they would pour oil over it and they would mark the moment, they would mark the day and it was their way of saying that we had this encounter with one of their gods and Jacob does the very same thing. And let me just remind you again, God takes us where we are, not where we should be. The day I gave my life to Jesus, the night I did, I went out and got high to celebrate it. And I'm grateful that God took me where I was not where I needed to be. He marks the moment, and it's kind of messy, you know, but I'm grateful that our God takes messed up people, and he wants to use them. If They'll say, God, I, I, I'll hear what you have me to, to do and say what you want me to say, and, and I, I just want to mark this moment. So I tried to mark this moment for myself this week. Um, you know, I, I got to practice what I preach. So this week, I went away, took a little bit of time by myself, and I sat down, and I prayed. And there was no smoke, there was no lightning bolts, there was no epiphanies, no burning bushes, no stairway to heaven dreams. I just sat down, and I figured out what my pain has been, and what my gifts have been, are, and what my character is, and I reflected on all that stuff in light of God's Word and, and God's people. And then I sat down at, at my computer, and I typed out these words. And here's the first thing that came to my heart. 
that I believe that God has called me to be a dream releaser, helping Christ followers locally, domestically, and internationally live into their kingdom, increasing calling and assignment. I believe that part of the reason God brought me to Grace Church 18 years ago was to help ordinary people, ordinary people. Do you know that they can't find a blue-collar large church, mega church in America? Grace Church is one of a handful because God wants to use ordinary people. And God brought me here to be one piece of the puzzle, not the whole thing, just one little piece of the puzzle, to be a dream releaser, helping ordinary followers of Jesus. But it's not just here. I believe God has called me to do that internationally. And that's why regularly I get on airplanes and fly around the world to help other leaders discover their kingdom increasing calling and assignment. But it's not just Christ followers. Here's the second thing that I wrote down. To be a dream releaser helping local churches, locally, domestically, and internationally. Now I wrote this earlier this week. This morning, when I opened my email, I got an email from the general secretary of the Methodist Church of Great Britain. This is kind of like the Pope of the Methodist Church in Great Britain. I don't know this guy. He sends me an email, and listen to what he says. He says, I want to partner with Grace Church so that Grace Church can help the Methodist Church in Great Britain. Now, now, God is our witness, your pastors would tell you. We don't go looking for this stuff. And yet, I believe God's called me and he's called us to help release followers of Jesus here and around the world and make a difference in this world. 2%, 2% of Great Britain goes to church. And God wants us, little old Grace Church in Cape Coral. Who cares and who knows where Cape Coral is, right? <laughs> and yet, in God's economy, He's chosen this church to be an instrument of renewal and revival in the world. Now, what about you? How are you going to market? Well, uh, take out your message notes with me this morning. And it's bigger. It's normally just a half a page, but it's a full page this morning. If you look on the inside, Pastor Kevin has masterfully written a, a, a front and back of writing a life mission statement. And I want to give you homework. I want to invite you to write your life mission statement, to just to go through this process. And if you don't know how to do this, you can come tonight at 5 o'clock. Is that right, Kev? 5 o'clock? You can come tonight at 5 o'clock, and they'll work with you. Pastor Kevin will be there. He'll he'll help you out. And we want to invite you to write your life mission. But flip it over to the back side. What I gave gave you was pretty preacher-ish. Look at this. My life mission is to help people through their struggles of sexual abuse. A woman stopped me at 10 o'clock in the starting point room, and she said, when you read that from the the front this morning, she said, the Holy Spirit grabbed my heart, and she says, I am a survivor of sexual abuse, and God has been beating my brains out to use my experience, my strength, and my hope, and help other women who've been victims of sexual abuse. That's God, not no fat Puerto Rican. That's God, listen to me, releasing this precious child of God and person of worth, this Christ follower, to live into their God-given greatness. Look at the list there. These are just examples. Uh, to be an encourager and advocate for people undergoing medical crisis, uh, to help retirees, to work with the homeless, and to help new Christians become fully. I don't know what it is, but would you dare to dream? Would you dare to sit down this week, take one hour, and go through this process? And then I want to ask you to do a second thing. I want to ask you to email back your God-sized mission statement. It might be one sentence or two to dare to dream at egracechurch.com. It's on the bottom there. And then next week, without sharing your names, we'll probably read a few of them out and share with you what God's doing. We've already heard amazing things. One couple in our church said, our God-sized dream is God wants us to reach a community that we live in that desperately needs to hear the gospel, and they're going to do it through barbecues and testimonies. I don't know what God's going to do, but here's what I know. It's going to be something good. What's your God-sized dream? Will you dare 
to dream it. Will you dare to dream it, hear it, and mark it? There's one more thing. Number three. Number three, refine it. Boy, I'm grateful that God refines our life. Because I don't know about your faith, but my faith is kind of messy. It's never been one of those set it and forget it kinds of deals. My faith hadn't been like a, a Tony Robbins seminar. Six easy steps to success. My life has been three steps forward, two steps back, around the corner, over the hill, down the, you know. Anybody else? And so God somehow in his mysterious, mysterious grace uses all of that to refine us. And that's what he does for Jacob. See, remember, Jacob gets up from this dream and he kind of barters with God. God takes him where he is, not where he should be. And what does Jacob do for the next 14 years? He goes and lives with a family member His uncle was named Laban. And he goes and he lives with Uncle Laban. And Uncle Laban was just as mean and honorary and deceitful as Jacob was. He finally met his match. And Uncle Laban tricks his nephew, Jacob, into working for him for 14 years so he can marry two of his daughters. He marries two of his daughters, but along the way, in those 14 years, Jacob becomes a fairly wealthy guy. He has cattle and slaves. But he hates his father-in-law, Uncle Laban. And so he does what so many characters in the Bible do. In the the cover of night, he slinks away, not even saying goodbye, and he takes off. And then along the way, several things happen, but along the way, let me tell you what happens to Jacob. He has a refining encounter with God. You read about that refining encounter with God, In uh, Genesis 32. Now, remember that before I read this, remember he's turning around and he's heading heading back to his father's land where 14 years ago he had said, God, if you'll take care of me and bring me back home, then and only then will you be my God. And he's going back to his father's land. And remember, this is the day before Facebook and social media. He can't go onto his iPhone and say, let me check my brother's Facebook status. Oh, look, Esau, I want to still kill my brother. I don't like him very much. Smiley face, winky wink, you know. (laughs) He doesn't know what condition his brother's in. He doesn't know whether he's been burying this bitterness and this resentment and he's going to take his head off at the shoulders. But all he knows is that he needs to start heading home. And he starts heading home. And on the way home, God refines him. Look at the scripture there. Verses 22 and 24. During the night, Jacob got up and he took his two wives, his two servants' wives, and his 11 sons, and he crossed the Jabbok River with them. And after taking them to the other side, he sent over all of his possessions... And this left Jacob all, what's the word there? Alone, circle that. All alone in the camp. And a man came, and he wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. Now, in the Old Testament, when God would send a messenger, what it really signified is it was like God was there. So this man is this angelic being, this messenger, and he wrestles with Jacob. Jacob has this twilight MMA match where where God challenges and changes Jacob in three ways. First of all, Jacob comes to terms that his name had become his character, that he indeed was a heel grabber, that he was deceitful. The angel said, what is your name? And he said, my name is Jacob. My name is heel grabber. My name is is deceiver. you got to come to terms with who you are. And secondly, when he does that, God changes his name. I always think of 2 Corinthians 5 where God says, if anyone is in Christ, they are what? A new creation. God changes his name from Jacob, heel grabber, to Israel, wrestler with God and with human beings and prevails. He takes this name of deceit and he gives it a heroic name. And then the third thing that happens is Jacob wrestles with God and he walks away with a limp. Can I just give you this little sidebar? I wish I had time to preach this one. Don't ever trust anybody who doesn't walk with a limp. I only want to follow somebody who's got a limp. Jesus had a limp. 
And so there you see three things. And what was God doing? He was refining the man, and he was refining the man's mission. He'll refine the woman, and he'll refine the woman's work. Now, did Jacob know what was at stake? Did he have any idea of what was at stake in him allowing God to do all of this in his life, to to hear this God-sized mission, to to mark it, and then to allow God to refine him? Did he really know what what was at stake? Now, stay with me on this one. Go with me a little bit of history. God had told his grandfather, Abraham, and Sarah, his grandmother, that they would be the father and mother of a great nation. So great, God told them, they would have so many descendants, it would be like the sand on the sea. And so they have one child named Isaac, his father, Jacob's father. Isaac and Rebekah have two children, Esau and Jacob. So God's told Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have so many kids, and they've had three. But then Jacob, he has 12. And Jacob's name is no longer Jacob, but what? Israel. And they become the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of those tribes was Judah. And when you read Matthew's gospel, it says, Generations before, there was a man named Jacob who had a son named Judah. And through his lineage, it was traced to a carpenter born in Bethlehem who married a girl named Mary who had a son named Jesus. Jacob didn't know what was at stake. Because what was at stake was the birth of the Savior of the world. And who knows, when you say yes to God's God-sized mission for your life, who knows what's at stake? But here's what I promise you. When you say yes to that second call, when you courageously say, yes, Lord, I will step into the God-sized mission you have for my life, here's what I promise you. God will use you so that Jesus, the Savior, might be born in others. What's at stake? God knows. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, too many of us are living like old Jed. (laughs) An inch or two away from the real riches. So this morning, as we turn our attention to worship you, we invite your Holy Spirit, the very Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, to quicken inside of us that God-sized mission that you have for us. Help us, God, to trust that it's going to be messy and it's not all going to be refined, but you have something great for us to do. Some of us in this room, the calling that you've given to us is to restore marriages. Others of us are called to help people in recovery. Some of us are called, to God, by you in this second calling. We're called to do amazing things that we can't even imagine. But, Lord, it's inside of us. It's latent there. It's just beneath the surface. And your spirit is is yearning to release your mission in us. Help us, just like we said yes to that first call, to say yes to this second one. Because only you know what's at stake, God. Only you know what might happen in the lives of countless people because we said yes. So come, Holy Spirit, we pray, as we worship you and do your best tinkering in your children today. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Everybody agreeing said, amen. As always, the altar is open if you want to come and pray. We're just going to sing this song, and then we're going to be done. So just linger for a minute. We're going to sing this song. If you want somebody to pray with you, lift a hand. If you've never said yes to Jesus, I'm going to be right over here by the cross, and I'd love to pray with you. So let's just worship.